Welcome to Wisdom Talk Radio, a collaborative community of explorers in conscious living. There has been so much written about both the real and the symbolic Mary Magdalene. What might those stories have to teach us today? Where does the old and the new intersect? I'll be diving deeply into that with my guest today. Stay tuned for someone very special. Hi, I'm Laurie Seymour, host of Wisdom Talk Radio and CEO and founder of the Baca Institute. Head there to discover your creative advantage by taking the Creative Innovator Quiz. Find out your personal creative innovator style so you can open the flow to your own creative intelligence and make everything in life easier. For visionaries, innovators, company founders, and product designers, optimize your ability to create more in less time while enjoying every minute. My guest today, Elizabeth Cunningham, is the descendant of nine generations of Episcopal priests. She grew up hearing rich and sometimes terrifying liturgical and biblical language. When she was not in church or school, she read fairy tales and fantasy novels, oh, like me, (laughs) or wandered in the enchanted wood of an overgrown, abandoned estate next door to the rectory. Her religious background, the magic of fairy tales, and the numinous experience of nature continue to inform her work. Elizabeth is best known for the Maeve Chronicles, a series of award-winning novels featuring a feisty Celtic Magdalene. An ordained interface minister, she is in private practice as a counselor. She is the mother of grown children and lives with her husband in New York State's Hudson Valley. Welcome, Elizabeth, to Wisdom Talk Radio. I am really excited that that you're here. Oh, thank you for welcoming me, Lori, and thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. Good to be here. So I I just read about the fact, I mean, I just shared with our audience the fact that you come from a long line of clergy. How has that affected your life as a writer? Well, I think that it's given me my primary material that I've had to, that's been a a blessing and also a wounding. Mm. So I've certainly had enough to work with my whole life. <laughs> yes, I, I, yeah. imagine. I imagine. Yeah. So how did this this character of Maeve, uh, and I, by the way, I, I, I loved the book. I mean, I only read the first one with Magdalene Rising. Oh, and, you've got lots more to come. And I've got lots yep. more to come. And, and I'm excited about that because I, I, if, anytime I read a series, I'm all, I always hate it when it ends. So, yeah. um, but I flew through that one. So I can't wait to, to get started. A couple of the others are fatter. And then the last one is also slenderer. Ah, okay. But there's four. Okay. I didn't know that there was going to be four. I didn't know there was going to be any. So in terms of how, how Maeve came to me, I did not say to myself, geez, I think I'd like to write about Mary Magdalene at all. Mm -hmm. Um, And in fact, in the Episcopal Church, and and a lot of Protestant churches, I think we're a little bit starved for the women. Mm -hmm. We don't really hear about them much, except at Christmas and Easter. So there weren't there, you know, we don't have all the saints days and the saint lore, Mm -hmm. at least not in the Mm -hmm. Protestant Episcopal Church, maybe in the higher church, Anglican churches. So um, I had written my first uh, not my first novel, my first attempt to really explore um, the goddess in The Return of the Goddess, the Divine Comedy, which was set in the Episcopal Church, partly really just exploring those relationships. And then I thought I had nothing more to say. You were done. <laughs> I, was, I was like, well, I don't know. I mean, you know, I'm open to it, but I, I don't think I have anything more to say. I think I'm just going to Somebody suggested that I do some drawing because I'm not an artist at all. So to go into a completely other medium. Mm-hmm. So I was scribbling and this rather bodacious character just showed up in a line drawing and she always had a hard time keeping clothes on or maybe I had a hard time drawing them. <laughs> her covers are yeah, consistent that way. And she told me her name was Madge. And 
she was a contemporary woman and contemporary at that time was the early 90s because that's when she first came to me mm -hmm. and um i didn't think i had anything to say but she had a lot to say wow and so she started talking and she had you know and she had little um biblical things to say like she was thinking about the body of christ and what kind of body parts there were and so who was <laughs> the six-year molar you know so she was very irrelevant she ate chocolates she was an artist she was a struggling artist as um i've been a struggling novelist all my life and she supported herself with um sex work and she made no bones about that uh -huh. and so i did a lot of studying about the lives of women in that profession then and yeah that's how so people get really upset with me because they're a lot of people are very indignant about any depiction of Mary Magdalene that draws on that um, apocryphal tradition because it, mm -hmm. it it was I'm reclaiming it because the Pope did it to sort of you know play on the Virgin Four archetype but I did it to say hey 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 the church didn't tell me what about what to do about having a female body mm -hmm. and um, if I'm a woman why am I going to draw apart from women who are in that role why am I going to say I'm good and they're not so Absolutely. she you know she was an activist and so she started talking and she's i said wow you're a really interesting character i think i would like to write a novel about you and i pitched her several ideas mm -hmm. and they, she thought they were all too boring <laughs> so Very, she, she was more expanded she was yeah and so she said you know what first you got to draw me a book of cartoons and then we'll talk so during the Gulf War hearings of the first Gulf War when the congressional hearings were going on. And then during that six week war, imagine having a war that only lasted six weeks. We don't know what that's like anymore. But the first Gulf War under the first Bush, I drew um, a book of cartoons and she was a basically an activist peace prostitute. Wow. So wow. she really had a whole character. She had a mouth on her. And then one night I was thinking, Madge. Oh, she also had fiery orange, neon fiery orange hair. That was the marker that she wanted. So one night I thought about Madge, M A D G E, Magdalene. A lot of the same letters. Hmm. Red hair. Hmm. Celt. Wow. What? What about? Would you be interested in being a book about the Celtic Mary Magdalene? And she said, Finally. <sighs> whether she was saying finally i had figured out who she was or whether she was saying finally there's some juicy material for me i don't know mm -hmm. so maybe she both. agreed <laughs> she maybe both she agreed and i started to do research on the kelp and i thought are you kidding me? this is not the romantic idea that i had about the celts they were these hordes that swept across europe they mm -hmm. deposited bodies in bogs they had traditions like fighting to the death over the hero's cut of meat. They were full of, you know, they they were characters, but they weren't easy characters. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know, I'm not, are you really sure that you want to be a Celt? Because I'm not really sure about this. And she said, oh yeah, I'm sure. And then I um, read stories about how there were islands of women um, in Celtic mythology. And I said, oh, so that's where you were raised. So she was oh, raised wow. by warrior witches on the Isle of Women in the Celtic mm -hmm. other world. So that was sufficiently outrageous for her. Mm -hmm. So that's how she came to me. And she hung in there with me for, well, she's still with me, but we worked for 20 years on these stories. And at first I thought, well, I'm just gonna write this book. And it was like, oh, I can't fit it in one volume. And writers have many ways of wasting time and procrastinating. So one way that I would do it is I think, well, the rough draft's gonna take me this long, and then if I do revision, and then, um, and then if I do another book, because she wanted a trilogy, then, mm. and and I, I said I'm gonna be writing these books into the next century. <laughs> and she said, "Did you have anything better to do?" Ooh. And I said, "Uh, no." Mm. Okay. So we were really went on a 20 year journey together. And that first book, Magdalene Rising, which you read, as you know, has a lot of Celtic lore and takes place in the Celtic other world. And then The Passion of Mary Magdalene, which um, was what my publisher insisted on calling it, even though her name was Maeve. 
mm -hmm. uh, really takes her into that historical biblical world of Rome and Palestine and um, the Gospels, mm -hmm. although part of it takes place in Rome where she's captured and forced into prostitution the way many people are today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the third book is the a bright dark Madonna takes place in the early church. Um, she leads them a merry ride. And then she ends up going back to the Celtic world um, because I put in a plot twist that I really was upset with myself for because I put in a tw plot twist that involved the Celtic warrior queen, Boudicca. And so I had to end up writing that book. <laughs> so, it's quite, it was, it's really been my life's work. Yeah. For, it was my life's work for 20 years. How does that feel now then to say, okay, that was my life's work for 20 years. And, and there's always something new, you know, yeah. there's always the next step. Where there is. That next step. What does that next step feel like to you? If you even know what that looks like. Yet? Well, I miss, I, I miss Maeve, but she's not missing because any time of the day or night I can talk to her. Mm -hmm. And what's really thrilling to me is that now that she's become part of many, many readers lives, they do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And when I went on social media, which I wasn't keen on doing because I'm a big technophobe. She, I mean, she, Maeve is on Facebook as a person. I have an author page, but she's on Facebook as a person. So what happens to old archetypal characters? They get a Facebook, Facebook. page. She talks oh to people. Goodness. She I talks to that. people. She's still talking to people. I so she's still, she's still with me. Mm -hmm. May Ruad is the name of her page. Um, once a week, we post something either from one of her books or one of my other books. I did go on to write other novels. I thought afterwards, I thought, well, maybe I should write a memoir. I mean, I've never written a memoir. I don't know. Maybe I should do that. And then I started writing about my childhood in, a, in the rectory. Mm -hmm. And I realized that what I had wanted to do, oh, I think I had tried to do it before I had children and I had not been able to complete it, was a book called Murder at the Rummage Sale. Ooh. When I grew up in the 50s and 60s, there, there wasn't any um, shopping malls. So everybody mm -hmm. lined up down the driveway, down the main street to get in to the rummage sale at my family's church and to uh, be there first and to get all the parking. Right. Mm -hmm. So it was like it was like um, Black Friday, but it was in September that we would have this rummage sale. So I thought I always wanted to set a murder mystery there. So I did. And then I wrote a sequel to that, which is coming out in the summer but didn't end up being another cozy domestic uh, i never seem to be able to write on formula my agent tells me this is a problem but it's not a problem for you is it well it is a problem for me not in the sense of i regret anything about my creative life but in terms of fitting a marketing niche yet i understand but... i've just accepted that though right. you know i mean and i also have several volumes of poetry and so uh, i keep busy it sounds like I you can't not write. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're familiar certainly with stories of the Bible, um, but then there are the stories that existed before. Um, mm -hmm. Perhaps those are the stories that you've talked about as being from the other world. Mm. And I'm interested to, to it, what you might have to say about the bridge between those stories. Well, um, you mean like the Celtic world and or the different stories in the Bible or? Well, the story, we have the stories in the Bible and then we have all the stories from the Celtic world and every oh, other yeah. world around the world yeah. that precede so, that. Yeah. Well, I think what I was becoming, I mean, I, what I really learned about a lot, what I did research on a lot was the first century itself, the first century Celts, first century Romans, the first century Jews. So I know I know a lot about those stories. And in a way, the book really is about, as you've seen, especially Magdalene Rising, is about storytelling. Mm -hmm. How do you tell a story? What is a story? What's the purpose of a story? Uh, as you remember from reading Magdalene Rising, when she met Jesus and he told her there is one story and there is one God, she thought he was out of his mind. Mm -hmm. So, so um, I think, that one problem people have today, I think, is um, maybe they understand it when they go to cinema, but a lot of times people don't understand in relation to history that it is story. 
-hmm. and that the kinds of sacred stories people told whether they were the um, biblical stories or other stories were not meant to be like well this is the real truth and these are the facts and you better know what they are and mm -hmm. they're only my facts and your facts are wrong even though um for jesus there was one god and one sacred story mm -hmm. it was still story mm -hmm. i don't think that people has you know said well this literally happened it was like a way of understanding the divine it was a way of understanding the human it was a way of understanding the world mm -hmm. and so i think people really need to get back to the idea of stories as something that can um liberate and heal and that there's not just news and false news um, mm -hmm. and manipulation there's also that stories have a, a different kind of power but they have to be understood as story yeah they have the power to to open yeah. and to allow yeah. us to unfold into something yeah and i think my feeling about the bible and I mean, not that I didn't read tons and tons of scholarship, especially biblical scholarship about well, what really happened and what didn't happen. Although my favorite book on biblical times was just life, daily life. It was about daily life and it was mm -hmm. all the phrases and how people understood things and what people ate and what people wore. Because I think that this obsession with, well, we're going to find out who Jesus really was and wasn't. And we're going to find out who Mary Magdalene really was and wasn't. Although it's interesting, and I think archaeology is interesting and history is interesting, but in some sense, these stories are stories. They are alive. They are going to be told differently in every generation, and they should be. Yeah. So when you say that, yeah. and you say that, this, that stories are alive, and I completely and utterly agree with you, and 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 know the power of story yeah. in that way. How can you? Hmm. How can you help our listeners understand a little more about what story might mean for them in their own lives? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that any, any story that resonates with you, whether it's a true story, a memoir, a novel, a film, resonates with you because it touches something in you. Yeah. And um, what was I going to say? Oh, um, yeah, I know what I was going to say. Dorothy Sayers, who is a novelist and a mystery writer, mm -hmm. once explained the creative process as the trinity. So she said, there's an idea, like you say, wow, I'm going to write a book about the Celtic Mary Magdalene. And then there's 20 years of labor. And then there's the story goes into someone else's hands, into someone else's mind, and it has its own life. Mm. and it changes because of that so i think that all the great stories are always changing and taking on new life love that and i think that i think it'd be it's interesting for people to even if they don't write a memoir to think i mean people say oh well that's just your story or you're stuck in your story i mean sometimes people in the counseling mm -hmm. profession will say that Yes, um, the, the, like, I, I, I'm sure like, I've said that ha having been an ex-counselor. An ex that's just your story. Well, yeah, that is your story. Isn't that mm -hmm. interesting? That's your story. That's how you're telling it. Is there another way you could tell it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think to understand that we are always telling stories to ourselves and to other people is very freeing because then I think we're much less apt to be stuck in the story. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we need to be shamed for having one. I just think we need to be invited to open it up. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. And I think one of the things that I love about um, novels, even though most of this novel is told from Maeve's point of view, I mean, I've also told novels that are from multiple points of view. And even when you're telling a story that's from one point of view, the other points of view get in there because the other characters have a say. Mm -hmm. So that I never have to say, this is the way it is and this is the right way. Because whatever Maeve says or whatever I say or whatever any one character says, another character can come along and challenge it. Mm -hmm. And I love that about fiction. And that's really what life, what happens in life yes, as well. that's what happens in life, yeah. So, in in your stories with Maeve, um, or at least the one that I've read so far, there was a lot about the going into the dark. Mm. And I put that into quotes, into the inner silence, what I speak about as the inner silence. Yes. Um, and for me, that is, it is an essential component of how we discover who we really are. Yeah. 
what, how would you speak about that from your perspective? No, I think that the, I love what you call it, the inner silence. The, mm. Yeah, I think one of the things that um, in our culture, we hear a lot about the light and the light is good and the dark is bad. So I think part of what's happening now is people are telling new stories and you think about the womb is a dark place. The earth where a seed gestates is a dark place. Mm -hmm. um, night is the time when um, things regenerate. Mm -hmm. Apparently, corn grows in the night. I didn't. So, yeah, yeah. Corn grows on a warm night. And everything, you know, you look at the morning and how fresh it is and how beautiful. That's because of the night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Maeve has an initiation, and, I, and Asus also has an initiation where she literally goes into the earth. Mm -hmm. And she remembers that she is part of the earth. Yes. She merges with the earth. And I think one reason why we're having a problem these days is because we think that we are other and that the earth is other and that we, we live on it and maybe it does some nice things for us, it feeds us or whatever, but we don't understand we are earth. Mm -hmm. We're just another life form. So interesting. Yeah, yeah. I speak about um, energy in that way. You know, yeah. that the universe is all energy. The physicists have demonstrated that. Mm -hmm. And we are all energy as well. And yeah. we forget. And we think we're separate from the universe in that very same way because we don't remember that we are all energy too. And, right. and, and have to address what is, what are the ramifications of that? You know, what does that really mean for us? And yeah. how, do we, how do we come to a deeper relationship where with our own life and our own potential yeah i think if we did remember what you're saying that we're all energy then we wouldn't be so afraid of death maybe yeah. Yeah. and death if we weren't if we didn't see ourselves separate from earth we wouldn't be so afraid of it either indeed, indeed. yeah because yeah we're just going back yes yes yeah, and that cycle is is something that's so um, important right now. And so I wonder if you if you feel like um, Maeve and or you might have a message around that in today's world that we're dealing mm -hmm. with pandemics, we're dealing with wars, we're dealing with yeah. crisis. I think that well, I just read um, Carol Christ, who writes on feminism and religion blog site, where I also write sometimes. She was writing that today that um, how we use language and even regarding this, um, the pandemic that we're having, mm -hmm. I mean, to say that it's attacking us or that it must be vanquished or that it's other. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I feel for people, there are people who are suffering greatly. There are people who are, um, you know, not able to be with people as they're dying. I mean, it's, it's a sad, mm -hmm. it's, it's a, it's hard, but um, mm -hmm. as I understand it, part of, part of how that happened is because of our um, relationship with the earth and how it's been compromised and how we've taken over a habitat mm -hmm. for a lot of other life and destroyed habitat for a lot of other life. Mm -hmm. And we've heated up the climate. And um, it's not, so that I think it's really important not to see it as punishment, but to see it as we're part of it. And what we are doing is having an effect. And sometimes we like that effect and sometimes we don't. I think for a lot of times we thought, well, we can just vanquish everything that isn't good. Like, mm -hmm. oh, uh, if insects are destroying our crops, well, we'll just vanquish them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we didn't think, and that, you know, I think a lot of impulses come from, well, I want to help. I want to do what's right. I want to, you know, make sure there's enough crop. Mm -hmm. And we didn't really think, oh, or many people didn't think, oh, we're also, oh, poisoning the groundwater, maybe killing pollinators. Um, so I think we're making a big shift here. All of us are making it. And it's easy for a writer who loves metaphors and loves to write and doesn't really have to do anything to talk about it. But I think that we're really having to see that it's not separate. If we do something, it affects everything, that we're just part of it. We're not above it. We're not below it. We're in it. It's beyond the metaphor. Yeah, yeah it's beyond a metaphor. But yeah, we can't, we are, we can't just poison the groundwater and the air and burn up all the um, fuels under the ground and not have a consequence. Yeah, yes. 
and we yeah. can't treat people the way we treat people also and not have a consequence. Mm. People, yeah, animals. I've been talking things. a lot about that, about our thoughts and, and the judgment yeah. and the blame. You know, we want mm -hmm. to blame somebody else for what's happening. And all that does is separate us even further. Yeah. And create yeah. that more of that, that, um, that energy of judgment and blame. And we're all feeling the, the, the impact of that. Yes. Yeah. One of the things I was just thinking about today and kind of standing back and looking at the effect of the pandemic, which is hard and also maybe necessary in some ways, is that to me part of what's sad is that the people that may have profited most from what we've done from the earth they can be fairly comfortable and safe mm. and um you know not that they can't get it too but they have a lot more resources if they want to isolate they can do that fairly luxuriously mm -hmm. and there's so many people that can't there's people in prisons and camps and um refugee camps and or crowded conditions or who have to work who have no, no choice who can't do that so I, I think that this is not only is this about what our relationship with earth but it is also about our relationship with our own kind yes, yes. we need to we could have a chance to look at that and th that if this is offering affording that opportunity is is a piece of the opportunity of it and yeah, if we, being, it, yeah. if we take it, if we take it, people are being, um, and I want to say challenged to look at all kinds of things, anywhere there's a, a disruption or a rupture or a fault line that suddenly is coming to, to bear, suddenly is coming to yeah. our awareness that we could have kind of covered over so easily before. Yes. You know, we could get busy. We could go out and have a drink with our friends. We could do whatever. And now we're having, it's like we're having to face ourselves. We really are on pause. Yeah. Yeah. And I hope we do face ourselves instead of, as you just said, finding someone to blame. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we don't have to blame ourselves either. It's not about that. No. And I think that that's a, the thing that I get pretty down on my own species sometimes, but that's when I think it's helpful to remember, I really don't know why we're, we evolved the way we did or made the choices we did or have the nature that we did but we are not separate from the planet. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what's going on or why, mm -hmm. but, um, but we're here. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I wanted to take it back to May for a moment because she is a character that is, my goodness, so <laughs> such a being that lives off the pages and, yeah. and creeps into people's lives. And, and I mean, and she was part of your life in such a yeah. strong way. And as you said, she still is. So what is it about her and, and the way in which she's been created or she's emerged that is so compelling for people and, and relevant for people mm. today? Well, I think one of the things that I think was important about her for me um, and maybe for other people is that she's not a disciple. Ooh. She's very clear about that. She's not a convert. Uh -huh. She is, I think one of the reasons why I wanted to write about her, and I think there is a hunger for this. I mean, and I think that I, I know I have a very different, she's very different from a lot of Mary Magdalene's, but I think many people working with Mary Magdalene recognize a hunger for people in um, hearing the divine or connecting with the divine through a woman. Yes. yes. And so when I sort of began exploring the goddess tradition, or I don't know if you could call it a tradition, the, God, the world that was emerging around the goddess, mm -hmm. it was that hunger for experiencing the divine as female. But I specifically wanted to experience um, an incarnate divine female, mm -hmm. not just an internal one, not just an archetypal one, not just one that I, you know, I wanted her to have feet. Mm -hmm. I wanted her to have problems i wanted her to make mistakes i wanted her to i mean i think what was very compelling to me about jesus and still is is that he was human mm -hmm. he, mm -hmm. he he walked around with dusty feet he washed people's feet um he didn't just stand back and say well you know you humans you ought to do this that and the other he's like oh okay i'm human yeah he got in there I'm in the muck <laughs> yep in the muck and i think that really what Maeve says to people first of all she says you can you can experience the divine and embody the divine as a female. Mm -hmm. And also she says, which I think Jesus did too, 
that we're all here mediating that um the divine and the human mm -hmm. not just um an ascended master or an avatar or whatever all of us are really standing here between heaven and earth with our roots in the earth and our branches reaching for the sun mm -hmm. we're all doing it yeah. so i think that she is a friend and a companion and she's accessible ah. but she's also um transcendent she's both yes she and we are and we are too yeah i was gonna say she gives us a way to see that in yeah. ourselves yeah that we ah, now i don't know about the episcopal church so forgive me if i step on anything step on any toes or mm -hmm. But for me, it's what's so important is to be able to go directly to the divine, that we don't need intermediaries. Yeah. That, um, you know, so many of us have grown up in traditions where we've not been taught that. You know, that yeah. we can't directly go and receive our own guidance. And, and I think, yeah. And, and that's, that's what Rosa Maid is so strong with. Oh, she is. Yeah. And I think that was what drew me to the Quakers. I'm not a Quaker now, but I, because I was in a church where my father was up there, Ooh, you know, doubly him and God and Casper the Holy Ghost. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think that that direct, um, I think that direct experience is very important. Mm -hmm. The Quakers also wanted to sort of balance that with um, our accountability to our neighbor and mm -hmm. to others mm -hmm. and they felt that people that were too individualistic were they called them ranters so i think that that balance between i'm an individual and i have direct access which is really important i think also is sort of balanced or leavened or with and i have my neighbor yes and i, I would say not only my neighbor the human but my neighbor all all life all my relation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the global community so, yeah. So I think that it's really because we're so accustomed to thinking in terms of individuality. And, you know, God knows I've got us knows I've insisted on mine, but to be also mindful that we are, um, we are, we are little, we're, we're little life forms mm -hmm. in a living part of a living planet. But we don't need a church or a priest to teach us that necessarily, but we do need to learn it in yeah. some way yeah. yeah so i think mave's trying to do that because and and jesus also i mean that they they're both learning it together they struggle with their own communities and within community and it's an ongoing it's an ongoing struggle i would say yeah, yeah. i hope this is okay to ask you and you can tell me yeah. if that's something you want sure. to do. but i'm thinking about that in terms of your own life and what you grew up with you just said you know about your father, the priest, and I mean, you know, the, the whole, the whole line of that. And how has that been for you to come to the place of, no, you know, I have my own direct relationship with the divine. Yeah. Well, I think that happened, like I say, when I went to Quaker meeting, that was very important. Mm -hmm. But then encountering the divine as female, yes. I um, kind of, it's Quakers at that time were struggling with their identity. Were they Christ centered? Were they Christian? Were they open to all comers? And eventually I realized I had to go um, find my own path. Mm -hmm. And I went to an interfaith seminary, which was very helpful. And then um, for many, many years, I did have a community that was sort of, a, well, you haven't read about Temple Magdalene yet. It's mm -hmm. in the next book, but a community that was very earth centered and open. And we we had a ritual. Uh, we had a community, mm -hmm. and that's a long story in itself. And that um, I'm not on that land or in that place anymore. But mm -hmm. that community still kind of exists. And on Good Friday, we're going to um, have our annual reading of the four chapters that tell the story of the Passion on Zoom. <laughs> so uh, I think that there's. Um, I think they've all always tried to find a way to be in community mm -hmm. as well as to be, as well as in some ways, I very much like to be a solitary, but I, I feel that tension in myself and in life. Mm -hmm. how, how do you love your neighbor? How do you, and who is your neighbor? My neighbor's human beings, but my neighbor's also trees and birds. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. 
and mm -hmm. the person on the other side of the world. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So that land where we were, which was my mother-in-law's, has been preserved in conservation easements, but there are many reasons why we couldn't carry it anymore ourselves. Mm -hmm. So. But the energy of it still is that exists. It's it still exists. It yeah. does. Yeah. Was there any relationship between that and like um, the Gnostic Church? Well, the Gnostics never. I mean, I read about them, mm -hmm. and here, and this is like one of the ways that I I don't want to offend anybody either. But my understanding of the Gnostics, while they were more inclusive of women, there was also that real. Um, spirit earth divide mm -hmm. and it was a little too dualistic for me mm -hmm. um like i say my i'm very very drawn to the incarnation and what i wanted in mave was an incarnate woman yeah yeah the so i like i like things i like earth i like earthiness i like earth i feel like well we're here in bodies that's where we are right now so let's right. be in them Mm -hmm. Mm hmm and do our best with that it's challenging sometimes yeah, yeah. I but, love that. Uh, you know it, it is challenging and it's challenging perhaps even more right now yeah and very there, yeah here we are and here yeah. we are so how are you mm -hmm. rising to the occasion to the occasion of the current yeah, of our situation yeah. well i have my husband is 81 does have a heart condition mm -hmm. so i'm being very careful about infection but i have um i have my counseling practice i have people from all over the country country mm -hmm. and in other countries even so some of it was on the phone before mm -hmm. and some of it i've done facetime so <laughs> uh and i'm taking care of my garden and i'm checking in with people you know who aren't my clients but i have a friend who would really like to create a way for people like herself, she's trained as a death doula, or people like me, mm -hmm. to be able to be present in a, a, in a remote situation for people who are struggling with having to care for and love their remote mm. um, people who are ill. So I don't know if that will come into being. She's really working on it. But I feel like, yeah, that's, that's needed. what I have to offer. It's mm -hmm. not really very difficult. I mean, it's difficult for me in the sense of being aware of all the trouble people are having. Mm -hmm. um it's not hard for me in terms of i've already lived this way yes i, I already I, live yeah. kind of i already like do my writing and my counseling and that hasn't changed mm -hmm. and right now going into spring and having to take care of a garden is pretty nice mm -hmm. i mean i'm pretty lucky i'm one of those people who's very very lucky in yeah, my that circumstances is that is really a wonderful yeah. thing. and my and my children are um i can't see them but they all are safe Mm -hmm. And they're able to re work remotely, which again, I was saying before, I mean, some of us have those, whether we were born to it or whatever, we're lucky. Mm -hmm. We can do that. We're not out in the streets. We're not out having to risk our lives. We're able to continue. We're not losing our job. Right. And I know that that's a very, very, very fortunate, privileged circumstance. It is. It is. Yeah. I, I, I feel that as well. The, the privilege of the fact that I work with people like you around the world and that I don't have to leave my home to do that. And yeah, I, I've never felt so blessed about that than I do right now. Yeah. And blessings on all those people who are out there in their bodies um, taking care of other people. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So your books, at least the Maeve Chronicles, um, have been published by Monkfish Publishing. Mm -hmm. um, is there something you could also tell us about how people, if you'd like, how people could reach out and connect with you directly if they wanted to well, be, see you as a counselor? The, I, I, um, I do have a website, which is called ElizabethCunninghamWrites.com. Okay. And People have to, people should theoretically be able to contact me through that, but I don't think that works very well. So I think if someone really wants to connect with me and is interested in counseling, they should, and they are on Facebook, mm -hmm. they should go to May Bruad's page ah. and send a private message. That works better also than my own, than my author page. Okay. So I'm, I'm more reliably able to get messages that way. Great. 
great. That's yeah. great to know because you know everybody's got their own way of connecting and being being available, and so yeah. that's and that's. Well, I wish my website worked better, but it it doesn't. I mean, the messaging doesn't work very well. But you can get a lot of description of my books, and you can get the books through the website. Great. You can see what you. I've written about my counseling practice on the website, so that's a good way to say. Well, yeah, I think I would like to know more yeah, about that. Yes, you do. Yeah. Yeah. Because you've not just got the Maeve Chronicles, you've got the other books that you. I've got a lot of other books. Yeah, yeah, I have three books that I wrote before the Maeve Chronicles, and another book at the Murder with Rummage Sale. All the Perils of This Night is coming out this summer. Um, I have four volumes of poetry that I've written. I don't think they're very. Most of them are out of print because the publishers, um, two of the publishers went out of business. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. And the fourth, the fourth one, um, tell me the story again. I just did through Monkfish's uh, self-publishing branch, mm -hmm. or it's called Epigraph, and that's readily available. So it's wonderful yeah. because we have an author here who doesn't stay in her own lane. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. Oh, oh yeah, and the author. Wild Mother and the Return of the Goddess have been reissued in twenty-fifth anniversary edition. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Most of my work is, except for some of the poetry volumes, is really easily available. Great. Elizabeth, thank you so much for being oh, here today. Okay. What is, a great conversation, Lori. I loved your question. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Is there any last, I don't know, bit of, any last message that you might have for us? Mm, wow. Um, I think just being kind is good enough and enjoying every everything that you can enjoy. It's beautiful. Every little, one of the things that I do in, when I keep a journal and one of my first sections, every day I write something called noticing beauty and I try to think of several beautiful things. Mm. So there is so much beauty still. Yeah. So to develop an eye and a ear and a heart for beauty. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Ah, that's, yes. that's very meaningful to me. Thank you for that. And thanks for being with us today to our listeners at Wisdom Talk Radio. Join us here regularly for more wisdom, discovery, and illumination. Remember, you can find us on your favorite place to listen to podcasts. And so if you've enjoyed listening today, leave us a review. That helps more people access the wisdom and transformation. And for more about fast tracking from ideation to creation and revenue, find me, Laurie Seymour, over at thebacainstitute.com. Take the quiz there and find out your creative innovator style so that you can turn your ideas into reality without missing another moment. Thanks for joining us here at Wisdom Talk Radio. We wish you well in your conscious explorations. For more information and to join in the conversation, our website is wisdomtalkradio.com or at Wisdom Talk Radio on Facebook.